Book of Mormon is an inexhaustible encyclopedia of knowledge. So it would take us forever to get through it, but there are certain things we must notice at the beginning to get off on the right foot. These are things that concern us. We think today as never before in terms of world politics. And the opening of the Book of Mormon concerns our people. I mean that literally, biologically. And it concerns our, also our world, the world we live in. So this is going to take a bit of uh, a, a historical resume of some sort. Well, we start out then by saying, I, Nephi. You notice it is an autobiography, I, Nephi. Now, at this time, the only style of writing was autobiography. Everybody wrote autobiographies. Everybody and his dog kept an autobiography, and there's a great autobiographical literature in Egyptian, and it starts out that way. The, uh, there are some famous autobiographies. Well, we'll refer to some because they're so very close. They take place in Palestine and so forth, even at this time. And... Uh, the, well, the style, I just picked up one here from, well, it was from the Bucks reading book here. It's called The Autobiography of Kai. He lived a short time before Nephi. He, he gives his titles. He's an important man. He gives the title, and he starts out by saying, I, Kai, was the son of a man who was Nehet and Sa'a, who was worthy and wise. And he starts out saying, I, Nephi, having been born of goodly parents. And then he goes on to talk about himself here. Uh, incidentally, I notice he refers to himself down here as uh, hedge hair, as white of countenance, uh, nephrobia, excellent of character, hebesh uh, uh, chet, uh, chet means clean of body, uh, in, in habits and moral habits, and he shew em seket, and he uh, and he shunned everything that was, the word sect is very interesting, it means both black of countenance, it also means uh, greed, or anything which is evil. Now notice in the Book of Mormon you use that peculiar thing, a white and delightsome people, a dark and loathsome people. It doesn't refer to skin color at all in the Book of Mormon. There's a lot about race in the Book of Mormon. That comes in here already, we can see that. But here, you notice he uses those peculiar terms. He was hedge hair. And he has a picture of a white mace and a picture of a countenance, white of countenance. And he was excellent of, and, and clean of, of body. And he, he shooed uh, M. Uh, Senec. Senec, as I say, is what is uh, greedy or what is dark of countenance. And, and he goes on and tells what, what he did. Uh, he was, uh, you never, I, I suckered. Uh, I suffered. I suckered the weak. I protected the weak against the poor. He says, uh, UNF. Uh, I was. Uh, I came to the aid of the widow who had no husband. I was a father to the orphans. This reads like the Old Testament. You see, and this is an Egyptian writing, in, well, just before Nephi's time. And he said, I organized youth organizations of children. Uh, during the bad times, and uh, I was extremely popular with everybody and so forth. These were like the Juventi they used to have around the Mediterranean. These youth clubs are very important. You have some in the Book of Mormon. We'll get to that later. Uh, and then he says here, uh, I came to the succor of my city, to the rescue of my city, in times, in the times when the Awa, uh, this is uh, MD, MD Herod, when the uh, robbers were on the roads, he says, see the, again plundering, uh, marauding bands, a particularly bad period. You see, this is what would happen to society would become unseated, and you get roving gangs, and they were very common all throughout the Mediterranean. And he says, I came to the rescue of the city when they, against these, these, uh, these awa, the awa is a person who plunders or robs and, and carrot uh, along the roads. And so he goes, and he, he leaves a good name behind, says what his name is. But everybody, as I say, there are hundreds of these, not only in the tombs. You left a, a, a stele outside your tomb with your autobiography on it to, to recommend yourself. It would include your sufferings and your triumphs, and ask the person to pray for you who passed by there. This is the custom in the tombs. You see it on the walls and everything in Egypt. And uh, there, so we have these hundreds of biographies, but also literary biographies. Now, the one I mentioned, the, the story of Sanua here, it's a good example because it takes place, it's an Egyptian, but who lives in Palestine. And uh, you notice the very strong Egyptian note here. He's writing in the learning of the Jews, the language of the Egyptians, and this is referred to again and again. So uh, this background here of the autobiography is a very interesting thing, and we have a lot of this in the Book of Mormon too. 
And talking about his goodly parents, notice what do goodly parents do? They teach you. Therefore, I was taught. You see, this is a very interesting thing. And the greatest favor he could have was great knowledge of the mysteries of God. Therefore, I was taught in all the learning of my fathers. That means the standard education, the going culture of the time. Tomorrow we talk about culture. We're going to talk about some history today if we get around to it. But uh, this verse 1 slows us down, of course. This is verse 2 and 3 and 4 and 5 and 6 and 7. We'll do the same thing. But, uh, and notice you always mention having suffered many afflictions. That, well, the purpose of writing a story, whether it's a thousand one nights or anything else, is to tell the, what the hero has to go through. <laughs> Andromo Yenapamusa. The Odyssey starts out that, but he had to go through Poland, down through Poland, and down through Canon. He suffered Poland, uh, up, uh, up upon the sea. He suffered many sorrows and anguish before he meets his final triumph. This is the regular plan. So that's the way the Odyssey. Poland hold en ponto agia. Many ills he suffered upon the sea uh, until he. And the same thing. The Aeneid starts out the same way, doesn't it? Notice these start out with the fall of a great city. Every one of them falls out. This falls out with this. Starts out with the collapse of Jerusalem. And of course, Odysseus is suffering on his way home from, from the fall of Troy. The same thing with Aeneas. Uh, per varios casas, per tot discriminum rerum, tendum in latio, uh, through, t through many trials and tribulations, to tot through many close calls, discriminum rerum, we are making our way, we are painfully our making way to latio, latium, where we have a promised land. The theme of a man looking for a promised land, the city has been destroyed because of its wickedness, that's the way the Book of Mormon starts out. And this leads us to a very interesting phenomenon that we find in the Book of Mormon and everywhere else, and that is what I call the recurrent scenario. Same things are happening all the time, and you'll find them happening all the time in the Book of Mormon. And this is a very good check, a very good control on things, the recurrent scenario, because things do recur at various levels. Well, we have plenty of chance to recur to that theme, but let's... Uh, Go back here, and then he re had been, been highly favored of the Lord. Notice, the, in spite of all their sufferings, they were highly favored, and they end up usually happily. And uh, they, they get their promised land. Having had great knowledge of the goodness and the mysteries of God, therefore, this is an extremely interesting use of the word mysteries here. What were the mysteries? These are the mysteries of God. Well, at this time, around 600 B.C. now, as I say, tomorrow we'll refer more to the, the cultural history of it. Uh, around 600 B.C., uh, this word mystery spread everywhere. Of course, is the, the Greek word mysterium. Uh, it means a thing that you don't talk about. A mystery is a thing that you cannot find out, uh, find out or learn about by your own resources. A thing you can't, finally fi can't possibly find out for yourself. It must have been revealed either as a primordial revelation in the beginning handed down or it's been revealed to you or somebody else, but a mystery. And it's something when you hear about it, always don't talk about these things. Therefore, remember what Moses tells. Well, this is a typical mystery when Moses talks with God face to face in the final words of Moses in the 41st chapter here. Uh, 41st verse, the first chapter of, of the book of Moses is, therefore, and in a time when these things shall be held as not, uh, they'll, they'll be brought forth again. When, when men shall hold these things as a thing of not, they shall come forth again as among the children of men. Among as many as shall believe, meanwhile you keep this very secret. And the mysteries are always handed down secret. Well, at this particular time, I'll mention this tomorrow more, uh, everywhere in the world there were cults and sects bringing up and spreading, all connected with each other in a very interesting way. And these were the mysteries. Everybody wanted to get in on them, but you had to be initiated to get in on them. Well, but he's talking about the mysteries of God in their proper sense here. Uh, the mysteries of godliness is what we, what we learn in the, in the temple, in the gospel. But he makes a record in proceeding of my days. One thing, whenever you receive the mysteries, well, of course, the ancient mysteries, the prehistoric mysteries, such as those of the cave of Trophonius on, on, uh, in Crete, uh, you would go through the mysteries, you'd go through the cave and so forth, and the Eleusinian mysteries, but you're always obliged at the end of the initiation, at the end of the mysteries, you are always obliged to write down on the tablet and deposit the tablet there what your experiences had been. At the end of the mysteries, you were required to record before you could leave the cave or the temple or whatever it was. So you leave a record of your, of your experiences in the mysteries, whatever visions it was you had. So he says an interesting thing here. Great knowledge of the goodness of God and the mysteries of God, therefore I make a record in proceeding of my days, of, of what I've been through, because having been through the mysteries of God, I'm, I'm, a, I'm under obligation to preserve that knowledge. <coughs> anyway, <coughs> we get off with the first book here. <coughs> 
And then he says, in the language of my father, now he uses language throughout. It's used very often in the Book of Mormon. We'll see in these earlier books, especially by Nephi, as meaning the manner of speech and the delivery and the delivery uh, and the message delivered. This was his language. Means this is this is the message he delivered and so on. As against language, the other meaning, of course, language is tongue or speech. And the same thing. It's very interesting. The, the Egyptian word for it is just a picture of a mouth. And it's as broad as you can possibly imagine. It means language, it means speech, it means utterance, it can mean a chapter. And nobody no two people's translated alike when it appears in the Book of the Dead. Does it mean a spell? Does it mean a chapter? Does it mean a recitation? Uh, speak the following words. All it is a picture of a mouth with a stroke under it. <coughs> but he makes a record in the languages, but, but you can't get away from this very odd thing, the language of the Egyptians, because the book recurs to it on, on a number of occasions. What would they be doing with the language of the Egyptians? So this is the subject of our theme now. Incidentally, at the time, the very time, the generation that Lehi was living was the time that uh, the Egyptian, well, it had always been the official language, that uh, reformed Egyptian, that demotic, became the official government language. In the day, in the 26th dynasty, time of Semeticus II, in the time of Lehi, it became the official way of writing, it was this new reformed type of Egyptian known as demotic. And at the very same time, at the very same time, uh, we're going to raise there. That means the common. At the very same time was uh, up at Mero, where the priests who used to be in the royal court, former royal court, at uh, I brought it in here. At Napatav, they fled further to Mero, and there they pr they produced a new type of Egyptian. At this time, which was which was Meroitic. Oh, I've got a picture of it here, of Meroitic. Come on, uh, and that's Meroitic. And when you compare the Anthem transcripts with Meroitic, it's very impressive. In fact, when when Brother Bushman back at uh, at Brown University, which is one of the four four universities in the country where they re where Egyptian has always been a big thing. Uh, he showed him the anthem transcript here, and uh, Parker immediately recognized them as Meroitic. He says, they're the closest thing you can get to Meroitic. Well, here, here are the anthem transcripts, you see, and, and here's Meroitic here. You can't see them, they're too small. But uh, I guess we should have slides or something like that. And uh, this was the the new Egyptian, which was invented way up the Nile, way up in Meroe, which is even south of Napata, that's the Nubian kingdom, where, where very interestingly, so many Book of Mormon names come from, way up there. Well, we can see why that is. Maybe in a minute we'll see, we'll see why that is. So let's consider what the, what the world situation here is in Nephi's day, which is very much like our, like ours, and and it's a time for, believe me, a time for alarm. So we'll have to draw a map first, won't we? Can make it big enough to see. Gulf of Alexandretta here. Oh, that's awful. Put Cyprus in there. We're going to put the we'll go down here like this. We'll put the the Nile. We'll go down here, and we come over to Thebes, and then we go down here, and we go down to Nubia, and then we have the Dead Sea here. Oops, oops, oops. Coming down. Well, that's about it, isn't it? Yes, that's right. It comes down here. This is the what they call the Jalf, the long. This long uh, rift you see that comes down here, and then this comes down here too. Then we go down here to Abyssinia, some Abyssinia. Then we must go out here to uh, to uh, the Persian Gulf. Yes, we'll take it this way. We all know the Persian Gulf these days. Oh, this goes down to Kathawar and that sort of thing. Oh, that's an awful person. <laughs> that that will never do. We'll have to put. Uh, well, here's your Sea of Galilee, and here's. Here is the, uh, shouldn't try to do it too fast. There we are, and here's, well, nearly that far south, just about. I've got to put the, got to put the Lausanne in there because it's always so spectacular to stand on the cliffs and look at the Lausanne. And that comes down there, and that's the, the Jordan, and here we are, and this is Sea of Galilee. And uh, we have to be more careful about Arabia here, though, won't we? Come out like this, and then it goes up like this. The, uh, and as you know, here's the Strait of Oman here comes in like that. Now that's more like it, isn't it? Uh, this one here. It's where we're having all the trouble today. And then the the Tigris and Euphrates go up there. There's the Tigris. They go, they meet here, and then they come again. The Euphrates and the Tigris, that's pretty awful. But that will have to do for now. Uh, oh, this doesn't do this. This just goes here, as you know, and here's, 
the uh, Rosh Hashanah, and the main, we'll put the main cities on here. Here's, uh, we'll put uh, Tanis here, and Sa'is here, and Thebes here. Thebes here, if you can see it. And uh, here's Amarna. We're going to have to have Amarna in this, don't we? And of course, we have to have Jerusalem, which is right here. The big J are there. And you have Damascus here. This is Damascus up here. And here's Tyre and Sidon. Here's Sidon, very important name in the Book of Mormon, you see, because this is Nineveh here, and here's Babel here, Babel here. Here is Susa in Elam, which is Elam. You know the countries as far as that goes. Now, what other cities, important cities do you mean? Well, this will do for the time being. Uh, it's got Jerusalem and the rest of them. Hope it's a lousy map. Uh, now, in view of the recent map test they've been asking in the schools, I'm going to say this is not a map of Utah County or anything like that. <laughs> this is supposed to be the Middle East. Now, in the, uh, got to have room to write here. The first autobiography we'd mention then is that of Sanuha, and it's a very important one. I was going to bring up um, the uh, reproductions of the documents. They're very good. They're in erratic, and they go back to 1935 BC. Famous Sanuha. Now, Sanuha was on an expedition for his father. He was uh, not for his father, for the king. He was an important man in the court. When news came that the old king Amenemet I had died and Senesret I had become king, there was a palace intrigue and he skipped out to save his neck and he went on foot here. This is the Delta. And he went on foot here and ended up here, uh, way up here in, in Palestine with the Amorite chiefs. And this was in the 1935 BC. So uh, this is long before our Book of Mormon time. But he lives in Palestine where he finds us a great advantage to speak English. Yeah, speak English, yeah. <laughs> to speak Egyptian. Yeah, people do. He became the chief of the tribe. He married there and so forth. And, uh, and we see uh, a, the uh, very close biblical parallels. There's the story of David and Goliath. He fights a giant there, and with one shot, he dispatches it with his arrow through his throat and so forth. But it's a historical account. It was very, was very popular. I have, have at least a dozen different manuscripts in which you can collate. They're already collated the way I have them there to show you how these were copied down in the schools later on. But this was standard. But the point is that Egypt belonged, uh, Palestine was Egyptian at that time. It always has been. It always would be. It's been back to 3000 BC. You find a good cave of the Nahalkever the cave of the manuscripts along the Dead Sea, which is south here. You can't see it. See, it's, it's about 30 miles south of Qumran. There's Qumran there. Yes, you can see that. That's just, <laughs> just a dozen miles from Jericho. There's Jericho. And you go down here, and there's this valley. And it's very much like, looks very much like Rock Canyon. You climb up these to the caves in a breakneck place. And there they've, they buried a lot of beautiful bronze instruments. <laughs> To save them from an Egyptian invasion around 3000 BC, the Egyptians had been up there and driven them out of Jerusalem way back there. Of course, there were no Jews in Jerusalem at that time, but we'll get to them soon enough. The thing is, we start out, this is a common, this is a common denominator in a common culture, as a matter of fact, here. The, it's not strange that the language, of course, Egyptian is a Semitic language, much the same words, the same counting that you have in, in Hebrew and stuff like that. But the uh, Libyan coast won't do here, will it? better. Uh, that the, uh, I would say, they have uh, analyzed the skulls, for example, of thousands of Palestinians from various periods and many thousands of Egyptians. There's, you can't tell the difference between them. They're the same race, the same stock, and everything else in this particular end of it. I'll see more of that. Well, this Sanua then, and next uh, comes, well, the point is that the king that Sanu was taken back to court again. And this was by King Senesret the I, the great Senesret the I, the uh, founder of the 12th dynasty, this uh, tremendous king. And he was uh, also, now this is, this is the payoff. These things all start getting connected here. Senesret the I is also known, confused with, hyphenated with Sheshonk. Oops. This is Sheshonk, not Sheshonk the first, but he is called Sheshonk. That's the name he goes by because the two have uh, are practically legendary. He was a, one of the great conqueror and so forth, but identified with Sheshonk. Now, Sheshonk <coughs> is the name we find, is the name we find on, ah, here we have it. 
Now I'm going to have you study this carefully when I hold it up. You'll see everything in it very clearly, I know. <laughs> little tiny book. But you all know this, uh, facsimile number two. If I ever get that book finished, I'm on the conclusion right now, but it goes on and on. Uh, Abraham, I hope the page hasn't fallen out. Here it is. Ah, there it is. You see this, it's so clear to all of you from where you see. <laughs> it's this. Well, the name, the, the only thing for many years, the only thing that the Egyptologists recognized on it all, it was quite legible. They had no excuse for the, the terrible things they said about Joseph Smith and so forth. Nobody made an attempt. They couldn't read it, but it's very easy. And uh, he has it here. The name is Sheshonk. That's the name that's written. This belonged to a king called Sheshonk. And Conventionally, almost everybody identifies Senesris the I with the Pharaoh of Abraham. This was Abraham's Pharaoh. His Pharaoh was Abraham with Sheshonk, and Sheshonk was the person that owned this thing in the Pearl of Great Price. I begin to smell a rat or something going on here. These connections, I say, are going to meet us everywhere. Uh, but also remember these things are fluid. They swim together and so forth because of the nature of the record. Remember when we talk about recurrent scenarios, where it's something can really throw you off and it can really help you a great deal Two, so, but this Sheshonk the first, and he's a, a he's the founder. Senator the first, he's the founder. I say of the great twelfth dynasty. <coughs> now, the next story we come to, we got to get some Jews in the picture. So remember, Abraham comes to Egypt. Well, if it's Abraham's, if it, this is Abraham's Pharaoh, I say nearly all people said is. I I wouldn't I would argue about it and so forth. We argue about everything here. That's the that's the name of the game, but. Uh, Abraham comes and then he has Isaac and Isaac stays in Egypt a while. His sons go down to Egypt and because his son Joseph goes to Egypt, he goes to Egypt and his son Joseph and the Bible tells us, oh, Joseph, who does Joseph marry? I suppose we should ask questions and all that sort of thing. Marries Asenus. This takes us right into the Book of Mormon because Asenus had two sons, you know, and one of them was Manasseh and Book of Mormon tells us that Lehi was a direct descendant of Manasseh. And the other was Ephraim, of whom we claim to be descendants. Elchema uh, Estai. Ephraim. And they were the sons of this Asenus, who was the daughter of the high priest of Heliopolis. Oh, I just erased Heliopolis. I should have put it on. Here, here is the delta, you see. And the delta goes immediately up here along the coast, and, and here's the Red Sea down here. Uh, but the delta goes here, and here, we're going to say Tanis here. At the base of the delta is Memphis, and here's Cairo, and in the airport, out toward the airport of Cairo is Heliopolis. It's the greatest, the most sacred, the most, that's the on of the Bible. This is the most sacred, the most ancient, the most enduring shrine in the whole ancient world. This is the great sun center of all mankind. It's a, it's a super, uh, a megalithic complex there had been there from prehistoric times it always was the top place most imp right at the base of the of the delta here a little south memphis was a little south of that but uh, this was heliopolis which i say is the on the yuan of the bible now on that comes from the egyptian word yuan which simply means standing stone columns you knew it they used the plural for the name of this particular one it means standing stone columns the 12 columns standing in a row and you get jacob setting up columns like that when he when he was in when he was in Palestine. But uh, Jacob comes down, I say, and his son, uh, his son Joseph becomes the vizier of Egypt, the second most important man to Pharaoh, and marries Athenus, who is the daughter of the high priest of Heliopolis and a direct descendant of Ham, and we are descendants of Ephraim, while Lehi's people are descendants of Manasseh. So we, we're getting into the picture right at the beginning here. It's a very important thing, how these things all tie up together. Then, uh, at this time, shortly after this, should we, do we have the people of the sea here, I wonder? Uh, I wonder if I put, I should have put, no, I've, well, Amarna comes before them. Let's take the Amarna period next, the, uh, after this, and we show it on the middle Nile, a place called Amarna, where Amenophis IV, king of the 18th dynasty, the famous religious king, Ikhnaton, the so-called reformer who taught about taught monotheism. Now that's a lot of, that's not so. Of course, the other favorites were just as monotheistic as he and just as pious as he, but he had a tremendous ego. And he, but he wasn't very good at some sort of things. We have to go, you know, down to Thebes here. It was down like that. And there, this is the Wadi Hammamat, and here is this sort of thing, you see. 
But here is a marne right smack in the middle between the base of the mile and Thebes down here. This is a marne. And there we find, there we find in 1887, the French excavated in the winter of 1887 and 88, they excavated the famous Amarna tablets. I should have brought them along. I have copies. Ooh, there are thousands of big things. Uh, the Amarna tablets. They're in Aramaic. Very interesting thing. This is 14th century, uh, around 1300s, 1350, and, uh, well, 14th century, the Amarna tablets. And they are written in Aramaic, the common language of, of Palestine. You couldn't distinguish it from Hebrew in those days, as Albright has shown. And the, uh, they're a record kept in the king's palace here of this Amenophis IV. I guess we should call him Akhenaton or Echenaton. That's his, the name he preferred. He changed it to that. Echen, Aton, the glory of Aton. Up, Ich, Ich, the glory of the Ach. See, it should be Ach, I suppose. Achu means glory. Ach, N, belonging to Aton. Echen, Aton. And this was his archive, and what it is is hundreds of letters, over 400 letters from various chiefs and kings up here in Palestine asking him to come to their aid, to come to their rescue. Well, who's invading? Is it Assyria? Not at that time, too early. Uh, is it the Babylonians? Not that early. It is our own people coming in very largely, all sorts of people coming down from the north. A great mixture of tribes that are named. There are the Guti and all sorts of familiar names. You know, could they be the Goths and so forth? But the tribes are really in motion in that time, and they're moving in on various places. The king of Jerusalem, which is not Jewish at that time, asks, of, uh, writes very urgently, will the king, because this is, see, this is his empire. This is the Egyptian empire. That's what you've talked and spoken and everything. It's Egyptian, but now it's all Aramaic. You notice they have a common, they have a lingua franca, and it's Aramaic here which I say is very much like Hebrew. And it's spoken all over. It's the official, from, and it's written in cuneiform. <laughs> the form it's written in is not, uh, is not uh, they already had an alphabetic writing, of course, Egyptians' alphabetic writing. They had an alphabetic writing, and they had Hebrew writing at that time. Well, no, they didn't. But they, uh, they're writing in cuneiform. That's the common, had one common, just as English is the thing today, Aramaic was the thing then. Everybody, any city you went to, any merchant, your documents would be in Aramaic. And these records are all in Aramaic, except for some exotic languages, a few of them, telling about these wandering, marauding bands. They're, they're driven out by, of course, serious climate changes and forcing everybody to move. And especially the king of Jerusalem writes, please come to my rescue. I'm being pressed on all sides by the Khabiri, which, of course, are the Hebrews by the Khabiri. Uh, they've been identified, of course, easily enough with the Hebrews. And of course, naturally, there was a reaction. No, that's just too good to be true. It can't be the Hebrews. But it turns out there are the Hebrews moving in in, in the 14th century on, on Amarna, uh, on Amarna, on, on Jerusalem, which goes by. All the cities went by their, that name. Uh, Beirut in those days was called Beirut. It hasn't changed. And there were the same riots in the streets there are today. And there were the same mass. <laughs> no, the picture does not change. This is the point. Because as, as uh, Heraclitus says, first of the greatest of the really early Greek philosophers, he says, ethos anthropodemon, a man's character is his fate. What you are, what happens to you, you determine it's your character that will decide that, you see. And it's the same thing. Whether people have riots or not, it's built into them. It's built into their characters, their culture. And, of course, it is a two-way sort of thing. The culture will confirm, will reinforce the character. The character will reinforce the culture. And if you, you want to start fighting, it just, it just, uh, it, it mounts put exponentially, and you end up being wiped out. I notice it's very alarming how much the figures having to do with various uh, retrograde movements in, in the atmosphere, on the earth, in society, and so forth today, how much more rapidly they're gaining uh, ground than anyone ever predicted. Things are coming downhill so much faster than anyone ever dreamed. We won't go into that happy thought until later. But, uh, but then, you see, as part of this, uh, the next wave of this, less than a century later, come the famous peoples of the sea, or the sea people. And these are certainly, our, they're Western Mediterraneans, and they can come as far from as far away as, as, as France and, and Central Europe and so forth. We have a very interesting writing on that Central European thing recently. But the... Uh, these are the people called the people of the sea. And the people of the sea, which come in around 1200, they destroy, destroy the whole world. They destroy the whole world here. This is what happened. There was the great Hittite Empire. Remember, 
Abraham was concerned that his sons not marry a Hittite daughter, but they married them anyway because Hittite. Now these were the Hittite Empire, and what did Hittites speak? They speak a language like Welsh, very close to our own language. You see, just as as the the Minoans over here, the, the Greeks in the mainland, the Mycenaeans were speaking something that you'd almost recognize as English. Just as at the same time here, the Medes and Persians way up here, they're still savage tribes. They haven't got they're not savage, but they haven't got dangerous yet. They're going to get dangerous soon enough. Uh, they, uh, the language closest of all to English. Well, anyway, the sea people come in and they go by the name of Sardanu, which is the people from Sardinia, Sicilu, the, the Sickles, the people from Sicilia, uh, they, they from the, uh, oh, the Tyrrhenians, the Tyrrhenians, which are related to the Etruscans of Italy. You have their blood. We have their blood in our veins, every one of us. They're a great mix of people. They come along the coast, they come with three, they weren't really sea people, but they came we're described among, uh, they're described as coming along the coast both ways, a squeeze play, carrying their wagons and their children and all their possessions on these big lumbering ox carts coming down. While the, while the ships would accompany them by sea, the, uh, later in the 11th, 12th centuries, the 10th centuries, the Vikings did the same thing in the north. They advanced the same way. The Vikings advanced more by land than by sea, actually, though they, though they were the great sea rovers, as we know. So these people move in and they destroy the Hittite Empire. It disappears all of a sudden. It was a great rival of Egypt uh, up until then. And uh, they, they smash the main, Egypt is driven out. Egypt doesn't have anything to do here. This breaks up into a lot of little kingdoms. As you could see, this already happening. So this is uh, the Sea People, well, 1200, you see. And everything changes. They come in and the story really begins there as far as, as uh, as Lehi said, well, another wonderful biography comes in, autobiography, a wonderful autobiography. That's the autobiography of Wen Ammon. Uh, that's the other great standard autobiography that was read in all the schools. And we're able to date this very nicely. This is dates from Wen Ammon. He tells a wonderful story, very convincing. Uh, 1087 or 85, well, let's make it 1085, he visited Tentu Ammon. He was a priest, a very, well, he was a director of the temple of, of Ammon at Thebes. See, Ammon is everything at this time. Ammon wasn't early, but Ammon is now, as it is in the Book of Mormon. He is a priest of Ammon, and he has to go to, to Byblos here, uh, not to Byblos, to Gubla, yes, it's to Byblos on the coast, uh, to get cedar logs. This is the, this is the Lebanon, where, Lebanon, Mount Lebanon, where the cedars grow, to get cedar logs for building the uh, ceremonial bark down there, a great ship, and to repairing the temple at Thebes. But he hasn't any money. Everybody's broke. Everybody, everything has been overrun by these people now. And he, uh, but he has a certificate from Ammon of the Way, and he has an image that will give him rights. He, and he, he's a tremendous missionary. He preaches the Ammon, the one God who rules all men, and so forth. And it's straight Old Testament theology, as far as that goes. But he's going to try to use that. And up here, this is Tanis. At this time, chiefs were making themselves independent, and at Tanis was a, a famous prince who made himself king there, was Smendes, with his wife Tentu Ammon, oops, Smendes, and of course, they have the money and the means up here, see, what you could do if you were strong enough is get a gang around you and make yourself prince of a small kingdom, and to legalize it, you could always legalize it by intermarrying one of the, uh, with one of the uh, priestesses at Thebes, that was the, the chief woman that Thebes was called, uh, the mother of the god, and there was the wife of the god. And uh, if you wanted your dynasty to be legalized by Thebes, you would intermarry, and this, this happened a number of times. But anyway, he goes up there, and he wants uh, to get some money for, to get the logs. The king says, all right, I'll make you out a requisition here. And he gets some money, and after a long, long time, of course, Official business takes ages. After months, he's finally able to sail, and he sails up to Byblos, but on the way, uh, uh, the Tyre, see, there's the king of Tyre, these Tyre and Sidon, remember Sidon is the main port in the Book of Mormon, it's more important than Tyre, actually, but he stops at Tyre and has his money, his gold stolen, what gold he has is stolen, and he fails to bring the certificate, and he goes up to talk, to try to talk the king of Byblos into giving him the logs anyway. And, there you have a, and then you have a scene that's really out of the Book of Mormon. It sounds just like Laban going in to get the precious things, to get the plates, to get the brass plates from, from uh, Laban, like Laban trying to get the plates from Laban. See, they come very close together. Uh, Laban, of course, means 
means white, means full moon. Uh, so Laban, and he goes in and asks the king, and the king, any money? Fine, that's dandy, we'll sell you. We've upped the price, of course. But he finds out he hasn't any money, he's furious. He orders him thrown out and everything else, the usual thing. But then he challenges him as a missionary. He says, look, I come in the name of God and so forth. And uh, the king says, all right, it's true. We paid Ammon tribute for many, many years. We sent logs to Egypt for many years. But let's go into the records and see. <coughs> so he sends his secretary in to bring out the records, and they've kept the records for hundreds of years, the records of his ancestors, see. Here he says, look, now my ancestors bought this and this and this from Egypt, we got, but we, but you always paid a good price for our logs. You say, we, we gave you the logs all right, but you always paid plenty for them. And that makes it clear that you're not going to get it. Well, it goes on, and he, uh, after many narrow escapes and so forth, unfortunately, the end of the story is broken off. Uh, he's cast ashore on the island of, uh, of Cyprus there, and uh, gets involved in religious procession. Uh, very interesting, one very interesting episode there, like a Book of Mormon episode. The one thing that saves his life, that he's going to be, uh, he's going to be thrown right out and not get anywhere, and the pirates are waiting for him on the sea and so forth, is uh, during a religious procession, uh, one member of the, of the procession, a priest, passes out. He passes out and uh, he uh, has a vision and he utters uh, words saying that the, the God commands that this emissary of Ammon should be respected and so forth, and so he's able to save his neck that way. Well, see, these things are all connected. Egypt and, and not Israel at this time, are acting hand in hand, but Israel is now uh, soon to be taken. And who, who takes it? Remember, they go in, and remember, uh, Joshua takes it, then moves in. But he doesn't take all the city. The, the main city, the, the city of the Jebusites, the Jebusite city is taken by David. He comes in next. Now David couldn't build a temple. He wanted to build a temple. He couldn't want to. Let's see what else do we have here? And uh, but he did one thing that has definite bearing on the Book of Mormon, showing again how these things are connected. You mustn't miss any of this. Uh, David had a commander, Joab, who was a rough, tough character. He didn't fool around with anything, and he sent Joab or Joab uh, down to later the kingdom of Emmon, uh, down south to the kingdom of the, uh, I mentioned it already earlier, but he sent him down to, uh, to quell the Arab, uh, uh, Arab uprisings in the far south, which is a regular kingdom. And he went down there and he drove out, he drove out Hadad. Hadad was a prince at the court there of Egypt, and Hadad fled from Arabia over here. He fled right to Upper Egypt, right to the court of Sheshon. This is another Sheshonk, though. And Sheshonk I, who founded the 22nd dynasty, we've come down a long time, you see. Hadad fled to the court of, uh, and he married uh, one of the king's daughters, or was it one of the king's daughters, or, yes, he married a daughter of one of the king's wives. It was a, well, they had many wives and so forth. But he became ingratiated with the court with King Sheshonk here. Now, Sheshonk had been, uh, is another story, I see, has to draw the delta again. Well, here were the Libyans. They're very important people. And they were constantly pressing on the Nile, moving in because bad circumstances. The desert isn't pleasant. They were always moving in and settling. And they came in a big way earlier this, and, and they settled, settled in Hermopolis for five generations, and the fifth generation of the family, as they, the pharaohs took them on and hired them as guards and military supporters and so forth. So they were able to stay without too much trouble, though they became quite independent, these great chiefs. And this Sheshonk, <coughs> Bubawaya, was the son, grandson of Bubawaya, uh, and he was the, uh, who called himself the great chief of the Meshwesh. The Meshwesh were one of these tribes. They, remember, brother, Professor Bear told us about this. The Meshwesh settled at various places, but he uh, made himself king of the, uh, he became king later on, but as Chiso of the Meshwesh, he had settled there. She mixed is not an Egyptian name, and uh, he founds the 21st dynasty he's following after. But at the same time, you have Thebes, the priestly, the priestly uh, dynasties at Thebes from the far south. You see, you have these directions here. We're going to have to do this. You have the Libyans in this, in this direction, 
pressing in, you have the Nubians or Ethiopians, either way you can call it either one, from Nubia or Ethiopia, from the south, pushing up, and you have the Amu or the Asiatics, always, of course, co coming from the, from the north and the east, uh, from the, yes, the north and the east, always the pressure, and the dynasty, the, the Ramesid dynasty, the 20th dynasty, they were Asiatics, very Asiatic, pro-Asiatic. These people, this 20, 21st dynasty, they were, they were uh, Libyans, and then you're going to have Ethiopian dynasties now, but they, they start out in in the royal, in, in the temple of Zeus, uh, temple of Zeus, in the temple at uh, Thebes, in the temple of Ammon there. And that was the person that started that, had been sent down uh, to be the king's son of Cush. They call him the king's son of Cush. That is, the king's chief son would be sent down to rule. This was Cush, the far south. And to keep that in control, so it was a long stretch kingdom, to keep that in control, the king's son of Cush would go down. That was the office he held. And this person had the name of Korihor or Herihor. He came up and became the high priest, and uh, as high priest of Thebes, and uh, he assumed that, but he kept his military office at the same time. They did that. The high priest of Thebes were military governors. Uh, but he had a son, Pianchi, whom he was able to put on the throne. Pianchi. Uh, this is interesting, I say, because these are good old Book of Mormon names, you know, Korihor and Pianchi. Uh, Pianchi is a name not found anywhere until uh, the late 19th century, pa Paanki, there are some very important Paankis, of course this means the living one, the one who's been made to live, and, and Korihor, the one uh, the presence of, uh, in the presence of Horus. But so we have our Korihors and Paankis in the Book of Mormon. You see they're involved in the same situation when we get to it, the very same sort of thing, because they set up the priestly court. Remember Alma tells, Alma tells Korihor when he's brought before him, he says, the first time priestcraft has been established in this country, we've been able to avoid it. And Karahor ruled, of course, by, by priestcraft. Well, as if we weren't sufficiently confused, we'll have to get down to, oh boy, we'll have to get down to, to, uh, have to get down to, well, Solomon and Sheshonk here. This Sheshonk. So Hadad goes over to Sheshonk, and David dies, and he's followed by Solomon. And Hadad is, keeps urging Sheshonk to invade Palestine, which had been Egyptian territory for many years. That was the Egyptian empire. And the great desire of his life was to reconquer all the old lost Asiatic empire of Egypt. And he was the last great conqueror. He, he did it. We're going to see he did this. But it was at the urging of others. And now this is biblical, you see. Solomon, he saw that Solomon was very strong and very rich, as you know. He was the glory of Israel. And he wasn't going to take Solomon on at that time. So he married his daughter to Solomon. And with her, he gave the Gaza Strip. To Solomon, uh, to Solomon as a gift, as a, as a, w a wedding gift, uh, with his daughter who married Solomon, uh, Micara is her name. And the three greatest buildings that Solomon built, we're told again in the Bible, were the temple, his own palace, and the palace he built for the daughter of Sheshonk. So they're very close. But as soon as Solomon dies, then Sheshonk backs Jeroboam who, remember, the, he, he rebelled against the uh, king of Judah, he rebelled against Rehoboam, and uh, he backs, uh, yes, he backs Rehoboam, I got it right. Let's make a difference, he backs Rehoboam against Jeroboam, the other way around, it's making a difference, the two of them. I guess it's Tweedledum and Tweedledee, but it's make, whether it's Israel or whether it's Judah, but that's the time Israel and Judah broke up, so it was no longer a united kingdom at that. But it was a great excuse to invade uh, Israel, and he sacked the temple, he, he looted Jerusalem and sacked the temple and came back with vast wealth. He got all the temple of Solomon and he took it back here to Heliopolis and established it here, used the same, uh, using the same uh, implements for the same rites and so forth. It's the most interesting thing, the Jews had come from there. Because here we have a sort of milk run, a sort of polarity. The temple at Jerusalem, the temple of Heliopolis were always always had a sort of a relationship. It was here that Abraham taught, we're told in all Jewish tradition, that he taught astronomy uh, to the priests and Pharaoh. It was at Heliopolis that uh, Moses was trained and grew up. Uh, uh, Joseph, as we saw, married the daughter of the high priest of Heliopolis. And everything happens in Heliopolis. And when uh, later the temple was destroyed, the Jews went down and were allowed to build themselves under only the circle drawer, were enabled were allowed to build themselves a replica of Solomon's temple at Heliopolis, the Sun Temple and Solomon's Temple. They're very closely connected, many associations between them. But he plundered it and uh, took all the wealth out there, and uh, Sheshonk did, and uh, 
Then there was a revolution under the next, then we have Shechank, well then he's followed by Orsakan the first, and then Takalot. There was a revolution under Takalot the second, it follows him, these various non-Egyptian names, and the priesthood then fled down to Napata, and after that they fled to Mera and produced our funny book of Mormon script. The, uh, but then, uh, well, Shabakon Bokoros, well, there was now time for the big powers to get in. With Israel, with everything weakened here, see, the Egyptian Empire, the Hittite Empire was out. They had been great and mighty, huge. And the empire, well, by 1200, they were finished. Fall of Troy, see, supposed to be 1174. And uh, the Egyptians were out, so it was a chance for the ambitious Orientals to move in on the scene, and that, of course, was the Assyrians. They were, they were uncompromising. They were cruel a absolutists, and uh, they had certain virtues. They had great artistic gifts and so forth, but they believed in absolute monarchy with a vengeance. They were notoriously cruel in defense. So the Assyrians move in, and in, and in 722, they take Jerusalem, or they, they take Israel already. So then we have 722, and that's Sargon, Sargon of... Uh, Sargon of uh, Nineveh, of, of, of Syria. He comes in there. Do we have any others here? Uh, we have Kashtamuzin. Well, who can, who can save Egypt from, they've taken all Israel now, all Palestine, who can save Egypt from Sargon? It's Taharqa who moves up there. Taharqa was a black, a great king, a great ruler. Uh, they had great rulers there in, the, in the Taharqa, and uh, he moved up with an army from Nubia, and he he reoccupied uh, he reoccupied Thebes and Memphis. See, Memphis is the nearest to Heliopolis. Now, Memphis was the ancient capital. Heliopolis was the sacred capital. Thebes had been the political capital most of the time. But he moved up and took everything over again. To Harker was in Thebes in in 790, and then uh, in the East Delta. Now this this takes us up to Lehi now. In the West Delta here, at Sa'is, this is Tanis, this is Tanis where the Semitic kings, the desert kings were living, but at Sa'is was a prince called Neko. He ruled he was going to make himself very strong. And the best way for him to make himself strong would be to join up with the Assyrians, which he did. Now you have Neko on the Assyrian side. He's going to change, when the Assyrians are smashed, he's going to change sides. They do that sort of thing, you know. Uh, and uh, he submitted to Assyria, and the Assyrians invaded in 673 uh, were driven out. They came back again in 671. We're talking about the Assyrians now. And when they came back the second time, Taharqa returned from the deep south and to chase them out again and chase them up way. And, but Asarhaddon, who was leading them at that time, Asarhaddon died. And uh, there were domestic troubles in Syria. The empire was crumbling, actually. And uh, then Taharqa returned again. So 667-76. Asurbanipal to get back at him, he returns to Egypt and drives Taharqa out. Then again, the next year, Taharqa returns and drives him out, and this goes on. They play, it's like a tennis match. It goes on, and uh, the son of uh, Herodotus tells this nice story. story. The son of Necho the first uh, was Semeticus the first. Now we're getting to Book of Mormon. Semeticus I, and he organized in Atsais, in Western Delta, he, he united the whole Delta, uh, getting the chiefs together and so forth, and, and when he was on the coast, marching along with his band, he, a large fleet of carrion pirates approached, and they landed and, and started to charge, and he said, I can make something of this. Look, boys, don't rob me. There's plenty of stuff inland. If you just, le just follow me, I can make you rich. So they all joined him and he, his army, he builds an army of Greek mercenaries, and from this time, all the Egyptian armies are Greek, and Palestine, including Jerusalem, is swarming with Greeks. You'll find Greek names in the Book of Mormon. You should, because they were popular at this time, and the Jews are always willing to adopt foreign names. So he found the famous 26th dynasty, the 26th dynasty, and uh, this is the one that, uh, that thrives in, in Lehi's time. For example, uh, under, from the time of... Uh, Semeticus the first, we find at Abu Simbel, way up the Nile there, where those big, where they've moved those big monuments see, of Ramses. They, they've moved them up on the cliff to save them from the Nile, the new dam. Uh, there we find inscriptions from the army of Semeticus the first, and they're all in Greek. He has a Greek army. That's what he's using all the time. We're, we're back in the, in the Greek wars now, and. Uh, 
Necho was killed, Necho's father was killed in the battle, and then Symmachus I again joins the Assyrians, and the Assyrians make him king. It's the Assyrians who put him on the throne, actually. So Assyria then plunders Thebes, but Syria lost their shirt in the operation, decided they never came back again. And then one fine night in 622, Assyria disappears. The whole thing collapses. This is because the Medes and the Persians and the Babylonians got together and tried to squeeze play to knock out Assyria. It was threatening everybody. The Medes and the Persians way up here in Central Asia, see? And here are the Babylonians down here, and here are the Assyrians here. The, uh, the uh, Hittite Empire has been eliminated here. The Amorite Empire has been knocked out. Everything was Assyria. They weren't, they weren't going to stand for that. So the Medes and the Persians get together. This is the great Cyrus, Cyrus I, with the Babylonians, Nabopolassar, and destroy Assyria. And the city of Nineveh vanishes from history. And uh, though, uh, though they make, well, they last for a couple of more years, but that's all. And now we have the situation set up in the Book of Mormon for the big, the big squeeze play. Is it going to be Asia or is it going to be Egypt? Is it going to be uh, the East? Is it going to be uh, the Babylonian Empire? Or is it going to be the Egyptian? And Lehi's family are split down the center as to which side to, uh, to follow. You can see the situation here. All these shifting loyalties and so forth. Overnight a battle can change the whole picture and you can be in grave jeopardy where you were in top of the world the day before. And so there's this great tension. It's typical of the Middle East, and it has always been. Now, uh, we ha I forgot to mention the geographic significance of the Middle East as the cockpit of the world and this sort of thing, but we can mention that in passing the next time. So it's time to go now. Uh -huh. I hope you didn't miss any of this.